morning. Today we start a new series. Today we are going to be looking through Romans chapter 8. Over the next several weeks we're going to be looking through Romans 8. In this chapter we find Paul writing to those Roman Christians about the power of salvation, the power and the impact that Jesus Christ had on their lives and the way that they're able to now live to the glory of the kingdom. That they, now there's hope available to them, this new joy, this new life that they can experience and share together. And so as Paul was writing, you, you start chapter 8 here, and it's almost like it's when your kids just run up, and they're so excited, and they're full of joy, and you find out, like, you're like, we're in the middle of a conversation, and they left me behind a long time ago. And so it's like, hold on, stop, we got to catch up here just a little bit. And I don't want you to feel like that today, as here we are in the middle of the chap book of Romans. But here as we begin to find ourselves, we see Paul answering the questions that he, he laid out in chapter 7. And so Paul's words, as we look over today or in the next couple of weeks, are going to be significant as they are words of impact. Words that we all should hold on to and write on our hearts and, and hold dearly and never forget that we can see the power and significance of Jesus Christ and how we need him in our lives as our Lord and Savior. And so when we have this presence of the Spirit of God amongst us, the transforming power that comes over our lives and that can move and, and to allow us to do great things, but what we begin to see is through this, this higher thing, that this higher calling is that you guys can have more than what you're having because of this resurrected life of Jesus Christ. And so Paul doesn't want them to get alarmed. He's not saying that you've done anything wrong, but he says, I want you to be aware that there's things ahead of you that could cause you to turn and to cause you to split. And so in that, it's what our awareness that we need to have, that there's two paths in front of us. One that would lead us away of our flesh and the worldly desires. And there's one of the Spirit. And as he calls out, he says, make sure you are aware of the way that you are calling yourselves to live. That you could be deterred, that you'd be pulled in this certain direction. But when we need to be following the Spirit as it leads you. And we see this throughout chapter 8. As today we just look at the first part, but we see in verse 9, you know, but in the Spirit, you're not by the flesh, but in the Spirit. And you see, therefore, in the Spirit, therefore... The Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead will also give life to your moral bodies to the Spirit who dwells in you. See, we can see those two paths. He says, the, the conflicting mindset that we're in of, of this is what I desire, but this is what the Lord says. This is what the world is telling me, but this is what God's Word tells me. And it goes back and forth to what seems to be true. And our minds can feel like this war zone, this battlefield, where we're constantly trying to pray for, for wisdom and discernment and what decision to make next and and what we're supposed to be doing, and it's not easy. And so here he says, laying out that we should be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. See, the opening word of Romans chapter 8 is therefore. Well, if you have a therefore, there must have been something before that he's responding to. So we begin to look back slightly at chapter 7 here, just to help us understand what chapter 8 is. In chapter 7, we see this interpretation of the law. And as Paul goes through and he begins to write and, and tell them about the law and some of the inadequacies of the law, but then when you begin to see his answer to all those questions in chapter 8, as he begins to respond about how significant and how to make things right through the law. Now, what is the law that they're referring to? It's the Pentateuch, it's the Torah, it's, it's the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in that, that process there that Moses was given these laws all the way back in Exodus chapter 24. But the law was this practical invocation. It was meant for good. It was meant for, for great things for them. But the problem with the law was it was there, but it was only able to open our eyes. only about to make it an awareness to let you know, to be accountable for your actions. But it never brought change. It, it was great for awareness, but never brought action. And that was the problem with the law. It never made God's people holy. And that was the struggle. The law could only go so far. Sin was able to be revived and under the system and, it, and brought death as he talks about that. When our worldly desires lead us, it leads to death. But when we follow the Spirit, it brings us to life later on. That's what he's talking about. And so the law was restrictive here. They could only do so much. And that was the struggle that they found themselves in. See, the law was, was an awareness. And so, if we put it in practical applications, maybe a way that you could understand better would be this. Have you ever gone anywhere? 
and you've got it on your phone or in your car, you put your GPS in, you put your location, you hit go, and maybe you're one of those people where you just like to count down the time, and you know where you're going, like me, like a lot of times I know where I'm going, but I like to count down the time, I like to be able to see like, okay, we're making progress here. And so, maybe the, the GPS wants you to go a certain way, but you don't want to go that way, and so you get that recalculating or redirecting, or you get to where you feel like it's getting so snotty that it's getting really angry with you, it's like, turn now, turn now, turn now, and you keep avoiding it. See, that's the problem. The GPS can only take us so far as we're willing to go. In the same way it was with the law in the beginning. That it was great, it had good intentions, it told them what to do, but it could only take people as far as they were willing to go, that they were willing to listen. And so therefore it was just a guidance system, but it would never have made them holy. And that is why they needed Jesus. Because they needed more than what the law could do. Jesus brought forgiveness and through his spirit he now brings us leadership and guidance as he dwells with us. So now we see in Romans chapter 8, starting verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sin's flesh to be a sin offering, so he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteousness required of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, Paul is bringing light to those people here that receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, once again, he is letting them know that as they're seeking out the, the, the worldly, and then they're seeking out the spiritual, as they're trying to find which way to navigate, he says, remember, when you're going by this, if you're just going by the old rules, the old law, it's only going to lead you so far. But he says there's a new way that can help you live in this way on the path of the spiritual here, Jesus Christ. And so in that we can see that there's no longer this punishment. And he says, therefore, the condiment, that, that what was due to us, this punishment, is no longer us because Jesus was able to take that. Jesus was able to take the punishment that was rightfully ours so that those who are in him are now able to avoid that. At the end, we were made fully righteous. And so therefore, as Paul was writing, he says, now as believers, you should be confident, you should be excited, full of joy and hope, because you have promised, you have this new hope, that you are no longer locked into this old, but you've been given new life to share together. And so Paul, as he's sharing his experience, you know, Paul was late to the game when it comes to following Christ. Remember, Paul was more known for persecuting Christians than he was for, for serving Christ until his conversion. And then on that day when he was converted, his eyes were now open to something new, this, this new way of life. His old life was leading to death, but now this new life is leading to new life and hope and this confidence. So that's what he's sharing with them. He says, we can be on two different paths. We can be fighting ourselves in our own human nature, our own human flesh, to turn back to this old way. And so God brings us out of our sin. He, he uses this this illustration of this old Exodus language. And for Paul being so new to the faith, it's interesting that he's able to, to relate to the scripture so well. And you begin to notice that God's divine nature in his writing and how he was in tune with him because he uses that Exodus language. He brought us out of slavery and he brought them into the promised land. The same way he's bringing us out of our human nature, our slavery to sin, and leading us into this promised land of this eternal life. He's shown us the way. And so he was still making us aware of the opposition. He says, just because it's been given to you doesn't mean that we're still not up against the opposition. We're still not up going against our, our human nature and our, our human instincts, our fleshly desire. And so as he talks about the Torah, he says the, the Torah was, was faulty to the sinful flesh. And, and that's why he brings it up. It, it, it wasn't being effective because it only takes us as far as that we could take ourselves and by being broken ourselves, we couldn't lead ourselves much farther. The fact is, we are who we are in Jesus. We are able to avoid because of Jesus. And therefore, it isn't determined by our walk or our strength or our wisdom, but it's determined by Jesus himself. And so Paul struggled with the laws. It's not that it failed, but it was rather the law intended to, to revive the soul, and it wasn't working. 
It wasn't doing those things for them. And so in that, he wanted the people's eyes to be enlightened, to be awakened to this new way as they're there. And transformation wasn't taking place. And so because of that, God sent his son, the sacrificial lamb that came on our behalf to die as the penalty of our sin, to making all of this possible. Forgiveness is now possible because of that. In the second part, he came in this likeness and living among sinless man. So we see that Jesus came as a sacrificial lamb, and on top of coming as a sacrificial lamb, Jesus came in the likeness. Mind that. Note that. The likeness of the sacrificial lamb. You see, if you're a sports fan, I know it's a rough subject right now, but those who are my sports fan people, you know the power of the home crowd. You know the power of playing in the environment that you're most comfortable in on the biggest stages. And a lot of times, it doesn't matter how good the team is, if, if you know you're going to a place where the crowd is always loud and you're always going to get heckled, you know it's going to be a fight no matter how difficult the game will actually be because of the outside force there. So there we see Jesus come as the sacrificial lamb to die for our sins to the likeness of man and yet here he is to defeat Satan on his home turf. He came to defeat Satan in this way where he was surrounded by the, all those intangibles, all the things that were, were conflicting in the mindset around us. And so in the law, unfortunately, the law failed the chiefs, the scribes, the priests, all the leaders, the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus even called them out. He called them hypocrites. He, he said, you're not doing what you need to be doing. They took offense to it. They plotted against him. And yet he continued to observe the law. They observed the law, but they neglected the bigger things. We see that the law failed the flesh, the human desires. See, the law was only able to detect sin, not defeat sin. And that is why we needed Jesus. Jesus came to defeat sin, that we would, through the cross, be able to experience life. So in order to defeat sin, we see that Jesus had to identify with those who were bound by sin. It's coming to the lightness of the sinful flesh here that we begin to see this nature of the spirit here. And so Paul had to choose his words carefully because while Jesus came in lightness in the human form, he did not come in sinful nature. And so therefore he came to identify, but with the spirit, he would still remain sinless. So yes, he looked like man, but he was not sinful like man. So Jesus took the wrath that we deserve. And since we are in Christ, the condemnation was on upon him that he paid the penalty, he paid the price fully so that we would be required. That our requirement for righteousness was fulfilled. That now he was called sin and we would be called righteousness. The require, righteousness requirement was fulfilled on Jesus Christ. He was our substitute. He was our way that we could look at this. And so now we are treated as righteousness. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus was treated poorly, so we did not have to be. We see in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, by the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not substitute, not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. We have two options. We have two paths right in front of us. The same two paths that they did then as Paul was writing to warn them. That you have your earthly, fleshly desires here, and you have the desires of the Spirit. You have this obstacle in front of us, and you have this mindset, which one shall I take, and which one will I stick to, and at which point... Well, I go back and forth. And Paul is talking completely to two different sets of people here, with two different sets of loyalties and two different sets of mindsets as they're going forward here. And so his, his mindset wasn't specific on one specific behavior. It wasn't that you were doing this one specific thing, but he said it's the mindset behind the behaviors. It's what the desire was for those who were seeking out their earthly desires. He says that's the question. And so he simplifies it. And he asked this question with a big answer. Where is your mind? What things are you seeking out? Your flesh 
He says, even those, some of the most notorious people who sought the flesh weren't really big sinners. They were good people trying to do good things. Peter, remember, as he was, he was talking early on to Jesus, he, he said, avoid the cross. Let's go a different route. We can do this. And Jesus responds to Peter with these strong words in Matthew 16. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, the person who sets their, their mind in the flesh, hey, God. They're not able to serve God when we seek other things. We're not able to serve God when our pursuits are going a different direction. With the mind of the Spirit, it leads to life of peace. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to the one but despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We cannot f- form ourselves into earthly desires. We can't form to the pattern of what our earth says is this is the route to go when he says this is the life I'm giving you. As we see in Romans 12, 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformation isn't easy. Transformation is a process. See, we can change. Change is easy. Everyone can change for a period of time. You can change your routine or your, your diet or whatever it is. But the problem was a lot of times when we change something simple just as our diet, you're like, well, I did really good this week, so I need a cheat day. And we go back to the old fleshly desire. See, transformation is that when spiritually when we're walking, we're saying, I'm doing so good, Lord, I'm in you. I need an earthly day. I need a fleshly day. He doesn't give us that up. He says, transformation is a lifelong work that we're continuing in submitting ourselves to the sanctification to being holy like our Lord and Savior. And so in that, he's seeking that with church, would you be transformed, not just changed, change desires to go back, that sin is revived, but transformation is the way of life that we can continue in pursuit after our Lord and Savior. And then we see in Romans chapter 8, 9 through 11, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if the Christ is in you, then even their, though your body is subjected to death, because it said the Spirit gives life because of righteousness, and if Satan, of him who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you, he raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. To catch the similarities of those verses, take a moment and mark those down in your Bible if you would. The Spirit of God who dwells in you, the Spirit of Christ in you, the Spirit who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you. As we learned recently, the dwelling of God is the tabernacle, his new dwelling place for the church we built is through you and I as we go into this out. So at this point, Paul was speaking in general terms, but now he begins to speak in specifics toward a certain group of people as he shares together in this. The Spirit of God who dwells in you. The Spirit of Christ in you. And so in this, he begins to notice that he's talking to this group of people, not to live by the flesh, not to live by desires, but to live for heavenly means, and so even in chapter 7, Paul admits to his own fleshly desires and the conflict that he is in to overcome those each and every day. The failing to do things right, to avoid the wrong things. We are torn between those two worlds, a life in the spirits and a life of the flesh. The conflicting struggle that we have there. And so we need to rest assured that Christ's spirit dwells in us. Proof. And we are his followers. So how do we know that we are in the Spirit? We can ask ourselves three simple, que- three simple questions. Here, he says, has the Spirit led you to Jesus? Has the Spirit put in you the desire to honor Jesus? Is the Spirit leading you to be more like Jesus? Is the Spirit at work in your heart? See, a perfect illustration is Ezekiel 37, where the prophet Ezekiel, he has this vision of these bones that, that as they, they begin to rise up, they, they get flesh and, and, and skin and, and all this and breath and life, and they, they rise up tell, talking about this new life that's going to be coming. As they stood on their feet, the promise that God would restore Israel, restore his people, and he did that through the righteousness of Jesus, making them righteous once again. It, it wasn't on the righteousness of their own perfect conduct, or their own perfect ways, 
It wasn't a credit to their life, but rather, it wasn't earned, but it was given. It's the Spirit that raises us up. God demonstrated His power over death by raising Jesus from the dead. And now God's Spirit dwells in us. See, Christ's resurrection was not an isolated case. Not only are, are we in Christ, but Christ is now in us. Because God cannot abide in a sinful place. The old flesh must die in order for the new to come into life. And so therefore, as we begin to see, His resurrection stands as the guarantee of our own resurrection. Our new life. And so where is our mind? Are we, are we still fighting for the fleshly desires of this world? Are we, are we willing to give it up, to die of ourselves, and to follow in His footsteps in the Spirit and where He leads us?